Hello, Pastor Steve Waldron here with New Life Pentecostal Church in Albany, Georgia, here with the Haley's Bible Handbook, uh, put out by Zondervan. Zondervan bought the rights in 1960. Before that, it was put out by Rand McNally. This started out as a little 16-page booklet in 1924 when Henry Haley was 50 years old. And over the course of decades, it morphed into what we have now, quite possibly the best-selling Bible handbook in history, in the millions sold. In the 60s and 70s, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association used to pass this out to converts. It is fantastic. It was one of the first books I ever read after I got saved, Born Again of Water and Spirit. And so let's look at what makes it so good. Now, Henry Haley, who was he? He was a Disciples of Christ minister for many, many years and a great lover of the Word of God. And I think that just shines through his Bible handbook. So when you open it, first of all, the size of it. I've got my large print text-only Cambridge I use. You can see it's much smaller, so it's very handy. It's an extremely handy handbook. And so you turn it open. It's even got maps, unusually enough, on the front of the hard cover. So that is quite unusual for a handbook or a book of any sort, is to have maps like that. So you keep turning the pages. Tells how many sold. This was this was from the 60s. I've probably got a few different editions of this. I keep them to give to young ministers and people who study the Bible. So when I find them at Goodwill or somewhere like that, really inexpensive, Baker Bookhouse, or use book section, I, if I have the money, I'll buy them and give them away. So this is just one I happen to have. Let's read. Okay, the very first thing you get into of writing, it says, the vigor of our spiritual life will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and thoughts. I solemnly state this from experience of 54 years. The first three years after conversion, I neglected the Word of God. Since I began to search it diligently, the blessing has been wonderful. I think everybody that reads the Bible could say that. It goes into uh, the preface, how it went from 16 pages to its current. Let's see how many pages it is currently, 857. And it's probably bigger than that now. They have it in a lot of different editions. They've got an NIV edition out now, just all kinds of stuff. Now, a, a fantastic thing that it's got in the front is the sources of information. The sources of information. And this is just where he got a lot of the stuff. And so these books individually are good as well. One of the fascinating things about Haley's Bible Handbook, there's another Bible handbook by Henrietta Mears called What the Bible's All About. And, you know, somebody got information from somebody else because there's some near identical sentences. It's not just coincidence. But anyhow, be that as it may, not the entire things are not. Um, here's things, more of those uh, suggested resources. Fantastic stuff. And a lot of this stuff goes out of print. So it's neat for researchers. You don't want to be trapped in your current dispensation when you're doing research. What may have been common knowledge 50 years ago may have been out of print for 40 years, and you may not know it. So history is written by the victors, all kinds of things such as that. So uh, it, it's good to know these things, like Cambridge Medieval History, Cox's Antonine Fathers. I would assume that's author Cleveland Cox, uh, Creighton's History of the Papacy, Duquesne's Christian Church, Fisher's History of the Christian Church, Fisher's Outline of the General, of general History, Fisher's The Reformation, Freeman's General Sketch, Hurlbut's Church History, Hearst's History of the Christian Church, Jennings' Manual of Church History, Kidd's History of the Church, Lindsay's History of the Reformation, Kurtz's His Church History, McLaughlin's church history. See, a lot of these are not in print currently, so just valuable sources of information. Then it has a table of content, photographic information. He's very big on archaeology. That's scattered throughout. One of my first passions, I went on to teach biblical archaeology at a college level, was birthed from Haley's Bible Handbook and even uh, began a degree program, never finished it, 
of a doctor of uh, philosophy in biblical archaeology. So notable sayings about the Bible. I love this. Uh, just dozens of people. Abraham Lincoln, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. W.E. Gladstone, Prime Minister of England. I have known 95 of the world's great men in my time. And of these, 87 were followers of the Bible. The Bible is stamped with a speciality of origin and an immeasurable distance separates it from all competitors. We can say a hearty amen. George Washington, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Napoleon, who had quite an experience with Jesus Christ there on St. Helena, he wrote this, The Bible is no mere book, but a living creature with a power that conquers all that oppose it. He goes on, Queen Victoria, that book accounts for the supremacy of England. Daniel Webster, Thomas Carlyle, John Ruskin, Charles Dana, Thomas Huxley, W.H. Seward, Patrick Henry, U.S. Grant, Andrew Jackson, Horace Greeley, Robert E. Lee, Lord Alfred Tennyson, John Quincy Adams, Emmanuel Kant, Charles Dickens, Sir William Herschel, the great scientist, Sir Isaac Newton, Goethe, Henry Van Dyke. Just fantastic. And maybe that's not a dozen. Maybe it's a little over a dozen there. But uh, Christ, the center and the heart of the Bible. I love how this starts. It says, The Old Testament is an account of a nation. The New Testament is an account of a man. God himself became a man to give mankind a concrete, definite, tangible idea of what kind of person to think of when we think of God. And so Jesus was God incarnate in human form. His appearance on the earth is the central event of all history. So, incredible stuff here. The Bible is God's word. A tremendous thing on the subject of inspiration in the Bible. The Bible is God's word. And you can just feel the passion and the love that he had for the word of God and its making of the United States of America and our Constitution. And, uh, but that's not really the, the heart of the Bible. You have the outline of Bible history, where and it, you can see that it's illustrated, the outline of Bible history. If you're able to see that. It has the Bible in seven books, the subject or leading thought of each of the 66 books of the Bible, the relative size of the Bible books, the three basic thoughts of the Old Testament, God's promise to Abraham, God's covenant with the Hebrew nation, God's promise to David, three steps in progress of Old Testament thought, and then on and on and so forth has important Old Testament dates, important Old Testament time periods, approximate values of Bible weights, monies, and measures. And the dates would follow basically James Usher's chronology. When you get to the book of Revelation, one of the fascinating things that he does is he gives probably one of the best historical overviews of Revelation. And what I mean by that is a histor he's a historicist in Revelation. He believes that Revelation has been being fulfilled since 70 A.D. until now. I personally don't believe that. But some of the information he gets buttressing his facts, some of the information is very good from history. So the land of Canaan, he's got that. What is Jerusalem, central city of the Bible story? And my pastor used to say, where is the USA in the Bible? He said, in Jerusalem, right in the middle of Jerusalem, USA. So I was like, well, that's interesting. World powers of biblical times, Babylon, Egypt. He's got good maps of that. And then he's got a very good section on archaeological discoveries. Now, this is before we ever get into the commentary part, beginning in Genesis. And it's just pages. A very good, like uh, where the first writing was. And scientists are coming around and saying, yeah, that's really where the first writing was. Sumeria uh, civilization just appeared in Sumeria. 
pre-Abrahamic books, the well dynastic prism, Nippur, Lagash, Akkad, which in the Bible is Akkadian, or what, actually it's Akkad in the Bible, it's Akkadian in secular history. Uh, books of Abraham's day, the Hammurabi Code, just on and on, just a lot of archaeological studies, authorship of the Pentateuch, and then he will get to what he's most famous for is his brief commentary. This reason it's called a handbook. A handbook is a little less than a commentary. It just kind of hits the high points, gives some things uh, within the particular books. But this is a great, uh, every new Christian, I think, would benefit from reading this. And like me, I, I've read it through. I couldn't tell you how many times throughout my Christian life. And I've got this sneaking suspicion I'm getting about to read it through again. It's about time for me to read it through again. Like some of the archaeological notes, Babylonian traditions of the fall of man, the temptation seal with a man and a woman sitting next to a tree with a snake wrapped around it. Well, that would echo forth to the Garden of Eden. Now, people say, why aren't the Babylonian and the Assyrian and the Sumerian stories exactly like the Bible? Well, because they were pagan, and paganism clouds our minds. And this is where the mythologies come from. They usually have a kernel or a central point of truth that they refer back to. Also on that page is the Adam and Eve seal, which is a seal of uh, a man and a woman with their backs down, like they're being driven out of the garden is another archaeological find. So many things, like in the British Museum, so many things prove the Bible. So interspersed without, he's always got archaeological notes, like ruins of the Tower of Babel from Burr's Nimrud, which Nimrod is associated very heavily with the Tower of Babel. So all kinds of stuff like this. Exodus, again, has great things uh, about uh, archaeology and the Exodus and so many fantastic things. A little uh, picture of the tabernacle, the Arch of Titus in Rome. Gives good chronology, dates and maps. Such as in Numbers, how the nation of Israel encamped around about the tabernacle, these type things. So it's just, it's really good. It's, it's very difficult to describe how good it is. Because, you know, you read through Obadiah, it gives you an overview of what's going on in Ob Obadiah, Habakkuk, this type thing. And then he's got messianic strains in the Old Testament. Foreshadows and predictions of the coming Messiah such as the seed of woman, Abel's offering, the call of Abraham, Melchizedek, Melchizedek offers Isaac, the promise repeated, Shiloh in Genesis 49, the institution of Passover, the day of atonement in Leviticus 16, the fiery serpent, look up and live, you know, John 3, 14 and 15, the star in Numbers 24, 17, prophet like unto Moses, Joshua, even his name, being changed to that which is like Jesus. Fascinating that Moses had a servant named Oshi, and then he saw the hinder parts of God, and it said the God, merciful and compassionate and loving and kind, all these wonderful descriptions of God, and then he renames his servant, Moses does, Joshua, which is the New Testament, the Old Testament way to say in the New Testament, Jesus. <laughs> so that's just fascinating. Uh, Ruth, uh, David, David promised an eternal throne of the Davidic covenant, the promise repeated to Solomon, uh, Job, I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, the book of Psalms, many Psalms are Davidic and, excuse me, Messianic in nature, Isaiah 9, 1, 2, 6, and 7, Isaiah 7, 4, Isaiah 4, 2 through 6, Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, Isaiah 11, 1 through 10, Isaiah 25, Isaiah 26, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 32, Isaiah 35, on and on. So these are prefigures. So if you're ever teaching or just wanted to study in your personal time about uh, prophecies of Jesus, 
fantastic section in here. And then it's got a very good section of what went on between the Testaments. I really enjoy studying what went on in between the Testaments. It's known as the intertestamental period. Many pages of that. And then you come to Matthew. And you would go from Matthew to Revelation. Now, at the very end of the book, He's got tremendous information, great information, how we got our Bible, the formation of the Bible, formation of the New Testament, page after page, apocryphal New Testament books, modern criticism, the writings of the so-called apostolic fathers, manuscript evidence, printed Bibles, the papyri, ancient translations such as the old Syriac, the Peshetto, the Old Syriac, uh, the Peshetto Syriac, excuse me, the Old Latin, the Vulgate, the Coptic, other translations, the Ethiopic, the Gothic, the Armenian, the Arabic and the Slavic, English translations, going back to Cademan in 676 AD, the Venerable Bede, Alfred the Great, uh, this type of thing. And then a great thing on church history the Roman period, the medieval period, and the modern period. Now, one thing you really want to try to get, he's got a section on the paganization of the church and how that occurred, and then all of the persecutions, known as the ten imperial persecutions of the church under the Roman Empire. He's got a very good detailed uh, review of that, the catacombs of Rome, the ecumenical councils, what happened at each of the ecumenical councils, how monasticism got started, how Mohammedanism got started, a look at the Crusades, the original form of church government, and just a lot of this. And then it goes into Augustine, City of God, imperial recognition of the Pope's claim. golden age of uh, papal power, the rule of the harlots, the darkest period of the papacy. Goes into a lot of things such as that. Forerunners of the Reformation, the Reformation itself, the Pope's War on the German Protestants. Now one of the things, you always want to make sure you get a copy of this that has all of that in there. When the Billy Graham crusade was passing these out and in order not to offend they took out a lot of that information so I think it's just a matter of history, it's accurate and I think people deserve to be able to read about it and how the Bible is really bought in blood papal persecutions is very fair, it even goes into Protestant persecutions such as Michael Servetus and so many others persecuted William Penn put in the Tower of London and John Bunyan uh, in prison, so many. And then this is very good. One of the best sections in this entire book is to encourage you to read the Bible, the habit of Bible reading. The habit of Bible reading. Everybody ought to love the Bible. And then he's got in here the widespread neglect of the Bible individual direct contact with God's Word, uh, we may indeed absorb Christian truth. That's the reason the United States in some ways was so united for so long because they had a national book and it was the Bible. I know the state of Tennessee just tried to make the Bible its state book. I'm not sure how that turned out. I know there was a firestorm against it. But so many people with everybody almost in the United States reading the Bible vociferously every day, even though there were different uh, groups and, and sects and cults and, and these type things, denominations, in many areas they agree, a uh, lot of agreement on the cross of Christ, on outward holiness, for centuries. And when people talk about, well, that's a cultural thing, well, they have to realize American culture is built on the Bible. So, the Bible, reading it is an act of religious devotion. The Bible is the best devotional book. What George Mueller said about it, Bible reading is a basic Christian habit. Helps to study the Bible. 66 books. 
accept the Bible just as it is. That's right. One of the great hermeneutical principles, when the plain sense makes perfect sense, then use no other sense. Read the Bible with an open mind. Read the Bible thoughtfully. Read the Bible prayerfully. Read the Bible with a pencil in hand. Uh, maybe look at a certain theme every day. Memorize the names of the book. Memorize favorite verses. It's the sword of the Spirit. It's how we fight the devil. Uh, Bible reading plans. A well-balanced Bible reading plan. On and on and on over this. And he's just got... Uh, things. And then it says the most important thing in this book is this simple suggestion that each church have a congregational plan of reading the Bible and that the pastor's sermon be part of the Bible read this past week. Now, we don't plan things nearly that much. We believe 1 Peter 4.11 that we should speak as the oracles of God. So we get messages from the throne of God prayerfully and thoughtfully. But I can see what he's saying there. And we do try to encourage every member of Bible reading plans and all of this. Now, another great section of this, and we're getting to a close, is the habit of going to church every Sunday as an act of worship to God. He says all Christian people ought to go to church every Sunday unless hindered by sickness or necessary work or necessity of some time. It ought to be a matter of conscience and an act of worship. And that is true. People who go to church lead healthier, happier lives, and it's just a fact. In the United Kingdom, church attendance is cratered. The United States is starting down that downhill, slippery slope. We're believing through the power of the Holy Ghost that trend is going to reverse. Look, entropy doesn't have to happen. That is the natural result of the fall. It, the second law of thermodynamics, things are currently going from a more ordered state to a less ordered state. But when something is intentionally pushing back against that, it can be reversed. And that's what revival is. And so Israel would have times where they would go down, but they'd find the book right where it was supposed to be in the temple, and there would be great revivals. And we're believing that for the United States of America before great judgments come on the United States of America, except we repent. So this is good stuff, the habit of going to church, uh, Just, just great stuff. The Sunday school and church, auxiliary groups and meetings, radio. Is it enough to be fairly regular? And then he's got a pledge. I hereby pledge myself that as long as I live, wherever I may be, unless hindered by sickness or necessity, on Sunday morning I will go to church trying to do it with one motive only, for Jesus Christ. I will try to go on time and I will be reverent in church and all my life I'll be a reader of God's Word. The very greatest blessing a community can have, in all caps, is a good more Sunday morning church service. Amen. <laughs> a summary of archaeological discoveries at the back. So if you don't want to try to dig through each book, it's kind of got a summary in the back. That's a very good section there as well. Like the Garden of Eden, stuff such as that. He's got a little section on what was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, then a summary of Bible places, and then it's got an index in the back, so you can just look up alphabetically any subjects you want. And then that unique thing on the back page, also in the hardback part, it's got another map. So literally every square moment of this book almost is used for something beneficial. So again, this is a Christian classic. It's been a standard, been around for a lot of years. They keep updating it. They make it bigger. They put full-color pictures in it. But the inside remains the same from Henry Hampton Haley, 1874 to 1965. He's done a lot for truth and promoting truth around the world. God bless you today.